Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. Have you ever attended a religious service of another religion, not your own? Well, many religions actually encourage such interfaith visits and interfaith cooperation and dialogue. But most religious leaders draw the line at initiation rituals like baptism, not wanting their members to engage in such rituals and make a commitment to another religion, a competing religion. Yet some Christians and some Christian denominations don't believe that baptism is even required to become a Christian, even though the Apostle Paul taught that the doctrine of baptisms is one of six foundational doctrines to the Christian faith. So, is baptism actually required to become a Christian according to your Bible? And what types of baptism are there? You know, should we allow sprinkling and or partial immersion and full immersion? And what name or names should a person be baptized into? And did you know that there are four different types of baptism associated with this doctrine of baptism? And that at least three of them, all Christians should want to engage in, and one they should never want to engage in. That's right. And so we're going to address these questions on today's edition of Original Christianity. So let me take you to a quote from Interpreter's Bible Dictionary about baptism and the nature of commitment associated with it. It says, quote, Some have maintained that the significance of proselyte baptism was purely ceremonial, but in view of the fact that commandments of the law were read during administration of this rite, it is probable that we should, with H. H. Rowley, a 20th century British theologian, see proselyte baptism as not an act of purification alone, but an act of self-dedication to the God of Israel. And so is that the way you look at baptism? Is it a self-dedication to the God of Israel and to Jesus Christ? Well, it should be. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. Well, we do that, we make that commitment in the waters of baptism as we're going to see. So let's take a look at some of the fundamental texts about baptism in the New Testament. The first one, of course, is in Matthew, and it's talking about John the Baptist and how he was making a call for repentance, which, remember, is the first of those six foundational doctrines, and he was baptizing people throughout Judea. And one day, Jesus shows up, and Jesus wants to be baptized. So in Matthew 3.13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us, see, not just him, but all of us, to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So it sounds like Jesus thinks it's pretty important that his followers be baptized. And notice that he came up out of the water. And that means that he was baptized by full immersion. Now, baptism is one of those words that is a transliteration in your Bible. In other words, they didn't translate it from the Greek. They simply took the Greek word baptizo and kind of did an English version of it. That's called transliteration. And so hidden in that word is the actual meaning of it, which means to dip or to immerse. And so if all the translations of your Bible actually translated it, and it was translated dip or immerse, Well, then every Christian would know how they are to be baptized, wouldn't they? That they are to be baptized by full immersion. And why would that be so? Why is that so important? Well, because of what it says in the baptismal chapter of your Bible, which is Romans chapter 6. So let's go to Romans chapter 6 and read this together. Paul says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been unified together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And so Christians who are about to be baptized should be taught that what they are doing is that when they enter those waters of baptism, it is like entering a grave. That's the symbolism. And that they are burying their old man, their old woman, you know, their old habits, the old person within them that, of course, defied God and, of course, was driven by the flesh and the ego, etc., And so every Christian who is about to be baptized should be told these things and told that they are making a commitment then to God Almighty and that they are being baptized into Christ's death. And that when they come up out of those waters, well, they're supposed to be a new person. And what does that mean? Well, we should explain that to them, that it means that now they live for God. And that means they're consumed with serving others and, of course, worshiping God in the way that God instructs. And it means that every time they're tempted or provoked, well, they need to be taught to acquiesce to God's spirit instead of their flesh or their ego or the influence of Satan, society, and self. So that's what's wrapped up in baptism. And it sure sounds like a major commitment to me, doesn't it to you? And so when we read through the whole baptismal chapter, which I encourage you to do, we definitely see that we are making a major commitment, a major transformation in our lives to live for God. Instead of serving ourselves, we're now serving God Almighty. So too many Christians are not fully informed of this sacrifice that they are about to make in the waters of baptism. So let me read to you Luke chapter 14, which talks a little bit about the nature of the commitment that we're making. It says in Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, Jesus says. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation, And, of course, that could be tantamount to the six doctrines that are the foundation of the Christian faith, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So, likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Well, we forsake all that we have in those waters of baptism. And so, You know, when the Job effect happens to you and maybe God allows someone you love dearly to be taken away, or maybe you lose a job or you lose your home, well, are you going to stay faithful to Christ? And that's what God needs to know. And so the waters of baptism, again, are a burial ground in which we bury our old person. And, of course, we live for God instead of ourselves. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So that's a very important statement. And it shows us that there's not only a baptism of water, but a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that is? All we have to do is continue to read in the book of Acts, and we find out. Because in Acts chapter 2 then, in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, speaking of the 120 disciples that remained loyal to Christ even after his death, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as if a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So it was kind of an immersion of the Holy Spirit that they experienced. And so even John the Baptist had said that Jesus would eventually come 
and baptize them with the Holy Spirit. He said, I baptize you with water, but one comes after me whose sandals I am not even you know, fit to be able to put on, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it comes through the laying on of hands of the eldership, as the Bible tells us. And so that's very important to understand. We all want to go through baptism in the waters, because that, of course, pictures the burial of the old person. But we also want to be immersed or baptized with the Holy Spirit, because that is what leads us into all truth. And of course, it gives us strength and guidance in the times that we are tempted or provoked. And so it's a very important concept to understand. But there is another form of baptism spoken of in Matthew chapter 3. It's in verse 11 and 12, and it says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, says John. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, a lot of people think that that fire was the tongues of fire above the heads of the disciples. But then that would have been a one-time event, and only for them. Now it says that Christ is going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so, what is he talking about here? Well, he goes on to say in the next verse, his, Jesus' winnowing fan is in his hand. Well, winnowing fan was used to kind of separate the chaff, you know, the tares from the wheat. And so that's what it's talking about. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so it's just like the tares and the, you know, remember the parable of the tares and the sower, and he sows the wheat and he sows, you know, tares that to come up among them, unfortunately. But the tares are thrown into the fire, and the wheat is taken into the barn. The wheat picturing, of course, the converted, the saints, you know, you and I. So this is one baptism we do not want to experience. It is the lake of fire. And it's talked about in Revelation chapter 20, the last verse, where it is compared to the second death. And then there's one more baptism spoken of in the New Testament in Matthew 20 where it says, Are you, disciples, able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said to him, We are. We're able. Well, of course, he was talking about a baptism of suffering. And that flies in the face, of course, of the health and wealth gospel that uh, is so popular today. Remember, Jesus said, Take up your cross and follow me. And so again, he's talking about the fact that we need to be baptized with suffering, all of us. The Apostle Paul said it is through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom of God. So these are the four baptisms spoken of in the pages of the New Testament. And they are, again, baptism of water, baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire, and baptism of suffering. What name should we be baptized into, or what set of names? Well, we'll take a look at that right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums, and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come. It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind, Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit OriginalChristianityReview.com or find us on Amazon. We've been talking about the doctrine of baptisms, one of the six foundational doctrines of the original Christian faith, according to the Apostle Paul. 
and we talked about the fact that there are four different types of baptism mentioned in the pages of your Bible. Three of them we want to experience, and that is baptism by water, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and baptism of suffering because it helps us to grow and to relate to Jesus' sacrifice. But there's one baptism we do not want to experience, and that is the baptism of fire, which is entrance into and being burned up in the lake of the fire. And that's talked about again in Revelation 20, verses 15 and 16. So what name or name should we be baptized into? And is there some kind of Bible ceremony, baptismal ceremony in Scripture? Well, actually, there is at least one, and there's other elements that we can bring in and learn from and include in a baptismal ceremony that we can call scriptural. So, in Jesus' day, it was very common, and it's important for people to understand this, for a disciple to take on the name of his teacher. You know, this was done in Judaism, and it was done by Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, one is your teacher, the Christ, referring to himself. And so Christ is our main teacher. We become disciples or students of his. And so we read in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so we take on the title. One of the titles of Jesus is the Christ or the promised Messiah. And so we take on that title, Christian. And then it says in Revelation 3, verse 12, Jesus himself speaking, And I will write on him, him who overcomes, my new name. And so even in the future, we're going to bear the name of Christ as well as the name of our Father in heaven. Then it says this in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, In my name, they, speaking of Christians, will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And so, of course, we pray in the name of Jesus. We cast out demons in the name of Jesus. You know, we lay hands on a person and uh, heal them in the name of Jesus. We pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus. So again, it's important to understand that we take on the name of Jesus and his title Christ by becoming a Christian in the waters of baptism. So it shouldn't be any surprise to us that the record of those being baptized in the book of Acts is all in one name, and that is the name of our teacher, Jesus Christ. We just saw in Romans chapter 6 that we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so there are five such statements in the New Testament, that one in Romans and these in the book of Acts where it says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and it was about 3,000 souls, according to Acts chapter 2. So, in the first sermon given in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter talks about the fact that Jesus was that promised Messiah. And he's speaking to the Jewish people. And then he says that they should repent and be baptized into the name of the one they slew. And so we take on the name of our teacher. And it's important to note that the first 3,000 converts to Christianity then were clearly baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we have that from Peter, and we also have this from Peter, where it says in Acts 10, 48, So he, Peter, ordered that they, speaking of Gentiles in Caesarea, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So again, these are very important statements, because you know this is what we have in the New Testament. And then it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 5, and this is Paul speaking, and it says, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Speaking of some of the people that uh, Paul had come into contact with that, uh, again, were Gentiles. And so these individuals were baptized in the name of Jesus. And finally, we have this statement 
Acts chapter 8 and verse 16, where it says they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, speaking to the Samaritans. So we have these three witnesses, Paul, Peter, and in this last case here, it's the narrative given by Luke. And so Luke is telling us that the Samaritans were baptized only in the name of Jesus. So why is this important to understand? Well, most of Christianity has been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And why is that so? Because of one text in your Bible. And that's found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. I'm reading the NIV. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so it appears that that's the command. And yet, you know, we just saw in the book of Acts and the book of Romans that everyone is baptized in the name of Jesus only. So how can we, you know, somehow uh, justify these seemingly contradictory statements? Well, again, your Bible gives us a principle to go by. And it's given way back in the book of Exodus that in the mouth of two witnesses, two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Jesus himself quoted it in the book of Matthew 18 when he was talking about, you know, whether somebody offends you. Well, you know, take two or three with you after you go to the person yourself. If they don't hear you, go get two or three witnesses. For in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. So we only have this one witness, Matthew, here telling us that Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so then when you look at the fact that, uh, you know, all of the early manuscripts, you know, from the fourth century, you know, down to the actual time of Jesus Christ, none of them actually contain that statement to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, most of them are missing that text altogether. So the first time that we see the text of, you know, Matthew 28, 19, of referring to baptizing in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, well, it's in two Catholic versions of the Bible. And so the fact that, uh, you know, they're Trinitarian uh, is a little suspect in that, uh, you know, they may have been encouraged to add that to that text and, uh, you know, we'll never know until, of course, Christ returns. But again, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the thing is established. And so, since we have three witnesses in the New Testament saying the baptism was in the name of Jesus only, well, Peter, Paul, and Luke should be believed. And so I think we should baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ only. And so everybody has to make up their minds on that issue. But do we have an example, then, of a baptismal ceremony in the pages of your Bible? Well, interestingly, we do have one, and it is in Acts chapter 8 and beginning in verse 35. And this is the story of the eunuch who is high in the court of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And he had come to Jerusalem in a chariot, a very nice chariot. And, you know, he was traveling back towards... Ethiopia, and the Spirit said to uh, Philip, you know, go and run after this chariot and join yourself to them. And so he did, and he's talking to the individual there, this eunuch, it doesn't give his name, and it says that uh, the eunuch said that he was reading a certain text, and he said, how can I understand it unless some person guides me? And so Philip did, and beginning there, it says, he explained to him Jesus Christ probably went through the Messianic texts of the Old Testament because there were no New Testament texts at that point. And so, you know, this is the example we have. So it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him, the eunuch. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
And so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And so we learn two things here, that he went down into the water. They were immersed in the water, as again we see, that's the way that we're to be baptized. But he was also, you know, asked if he really believed, fully believed in Jesus. And he responded, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So again, the center here is Jesus, not again, someone being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's very important in light of the fact that you know, it was Peter himself who answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that's a very important part, and it's the only dialogue we have at a baptismal ceremony, and so I think it should be included in every baptism. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says that everything should be done through prayer and supplication. So I think it's also safe to assume that they probably prayed you know, the beginning of that ceremony, and we should too. And then, of course, the baptizee should be instructed that he or she is actually being initiated into the school of Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, verse 29 says, Take my yoke, Jesus says, upon you and learn from me. Well, that's a lifelong process. You know, you could study just the red letter edition of your Bible and the Gospels where Jesus speaks and probably study it all your life and continue to learn the depths of what Christ taught. And so we're to be a disciple of Jesus and we should remind people at the service that, you know, this person is being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ and into his school to be taught by him. A baptizee should also be reminded that he or she is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, as we're told in 1 Peter 2.21, that we're to take up you know, the cross and follow Jesus Christ, that we're to abide in his word, that we're to bear much fruit, and that we are to love one another. And also that we are to take the word of God, that we are to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. And the baptizee then should be reminded that they are entering into the new covenant. We have this in Hebrews 9 and verse 15, which says, He, Christ, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions of the law done under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. So when the Israelites made a covenant with God in the Old Testament, they said, all that the Lord has commanded, we will do. I think we should say the same thing. Every baptizee should say, all that the Lord has commanded, I will do. So remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the disciples, it should be good enough for you and me. Thanks for watching.